Welcome to Global Connections with Robert Siegel, presented by the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center. Our monthly leaders forum addresses vital issues facing society, the economy, real estate, medicine, technology, and science. My name is Dr. Joshua Plow. I'm the executive director of American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, a 501c3 National American Charitable Organization based in New York City. We at AFRMC represent Israel's premier hospital, Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva in Greater Tel Aviv, the leading institution named in honor of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. The hospital is a motto of coexistence as it serves 1 million patients annually from all ethnic and religious backgrounds with the same compassionate care. Please support our mission. Join our community of friends. Visit American Friends of Rabin Medical Center via our website and social media outlets on Twitter and Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube, and on our Facebook page and discussion group. Today's Global Connections topic is Who's Afraid of Artificial Intelligence? We thank our special guest, Sherry Turkle, Professor of Social Studies of Science and Technology at MIT. Daniel Rockmore, Director of the Newcomb Institute for Computational Science and Professor of Math and Computer Science at Dartmouth College. And Dr. Lior Pearl, Director of Israel's Rabbi Medical Center's Innovation Center and the two-time recipient of the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center's Fellowship Award, during which he was at Stanford University Medical Center. And now, Global Connections with Robert Siegel. Thank you, Josh. Let's face it. We have entered the age of artificial intelligence. It screams at us in the news, in thoughtful essays, in expressions of fear that humanity's dominion over machines might someday be overthrown or hopes that these new machines might permit humanity to solve problems that are just too tough for the human brain. Here are some experiences I've had recently. I listened to a chunk of a conversation between two European intellectuals, a German filmmaker, a Slovenian philosopher. They spoke in English, it was all on the audio, uh, but in fact, each man's voice uh, had been constructed from sampled snippets uh, of their real voices that had been recorded. Uh, so each spoke with a recognizable vocal quality and accent, uh, but it was completely synthesized. Uh, what they said, the ideas they expressed were typical of things they had said and written in public. Uh, so it, it was an interesting conversation and completely constructed artificially. Uh, at a less lofty uh, academic uh, level, I read of the concerns among teachers that students might be uh, popping essay assignments into a chatbot and uh, ordering up an essay of just the right length that's good enough to pass for human. A genealogist uh, recently solved the mystery of my grandfather's birth date in Europe in a matter of a few minutes. Uh, critical to her speech, she told me, uh, were advances in AI that made it possible to decipher the uh, documents from 19th century Poland written in a, a looping cursive uh, that uh, was favored by clerks and public, reg reg public registrars of the day. And uh, perhaps like, like uh, many of you, I read a New York Times reporter's peculiar conversation with a search engine a persona named Sydney, uh, spelled with a, with, uh, and androgynously with a Y, uh, Sidney told the reporter to get out of his marriage, that it was a, a bad marriage, uh, despite the reporters uh, uh, not agreeing with that, and also had some, some curiosity to, to express about nuclear codes. Uh, AI has dazzled many of us, and it's scared quite a few of us too. What, what, what would it be like to live with computers that are actually uh, capable of learning, capable of perpetrating exquisite forgeries and frauds? Uh, or would the benefits of a new level of automation uh, reduce the guesswork in everything from medical diagnoses to military targeting? 
An open letter signed by hundreds of computer scientists and entrepreneurs called for a six month pause in work on all AI on a level more powerful than that of GPT-4. Uh, that's the newest model from the company OpenAI. It's a large multimodal model, uh, meaning I have learned that it can be trained to learn both text and uh, images and produce output in the form of human-like speech. Uh, the open letter calling for this, this pause of six months uh, said this, advanced AI could represent a profound change in the history of life on earth and should be planned for and managed with commensurate care and resources. And it asks, should we develop non-human minds that might eventually outnumber, outsmart and replace us? Well, our panel today is not one of entrepreneurs uh, or people working in the artificial land where Sydney uh, and friends abide. It consists though of people who have thought a lot about computers, about their benefits, and maybe sometimes about the dangers uh, as they get more and more like us. And our first panelist is Dan Rockmore, who is a professor of math and computer science at Dartmouth College. Uh, professor Rockmore has a special interest in the potential of artificial intelligence producing writing that's uh, uh, seemingly so human that if we didn't know the source of it, uh, we couldn't tell whether it were written by uh, humans or by computers. And uh, Dan Rockmore, since you're a professor of, of computer science, I'm going to give you the uh, the first uh, bit of heavy lifting to do here, which is just give us a definition. How What is artificial intelligence? Um, well, I mean, it's it's been a moving target. I... I uh... I mean, roughly the way we think of it this way, or many people think of it, is um, it's it's about machines being able to predict stuff based on um, history, uh, which you might view as your own form of intelligence, that you acquire some knowledge and then you are presented with a new situation that's kind of like an old situation, which then affects how you respond to it and whether you respond to it in a way that's good for you that's right. that feels intelligent if you respond to a way in which it's not so helpful that feels like that was an unintelligent response so most of artificial intelligence is really about very very good prediction of something um based on data but depending on the context we as humans think of those predictions as feeling intelligent in some environment or not so it's a phenomenally more what were what were the stories we're hearing about it? Yes, a phenomenally more sophisticated and powerful version of what my smartphone does when I'm typing, and it gives me a choice of what the most logical next three words would be. That, that that's uh, yes, um, in that so in that so that's a particular context where the machine is trying to be smart about what it thinks you're going to type next to save you some time. Um, and again, it's a, I mean, it's a prediction thing. Uh, if you're comparing your smartphone to what's going on on chat GPT, there's a lot more data under the hood, um, in those two mm -hmm. models. Chat GPT is trained on many, many more, uh, images, uh, even some, some people think actually conversations like the conversation we're having, um, as well as text, uh, your, your, your phone has less of that. When we, we you, the the verb we use is to train the computer to yes. to, uh, to give it this uh, this uh, base of information from which it will create answers if if, if we ask it questions. Um, a few years ago, we we uh, we dealt with each other when you had a contest at Dartmouth uh, uh, that was about AI and poetry, and and the, I was I was a judge. The question was: Here are six sonnets, which which were written by people, and which were written by uh, computers. I it took meet no time to see which was which because the computers got rhythm and, and rhyme right, but they, they lack meaning in some way. Now uh, we're seeing we're seeing a different level uh, coming out. And on the recent 60 minutes, uh, either a a coherent poem was written to order by AI, or I would hold open the possibility it was simply lifted out of some obscure poetry journal. I have, I have no idea. Uh, how how do you describe how much progress has been made in that in that area? Uh, I, I mean, so the progress has been extraordinary. The uh, discovery that these um, what are called transformer models, uh, certain kinds of uh, neural networks. Sorry to throw some terminology, but um, uh, computational architectures that are some there's some sort of cartoon of the way in which your own wet neural network in your brain um, uh, looks. 
uh, but this particular sort of this particular kind of architecture called a transformer architecture has really been a game changer uh, in terms of uh, machines' abilities to predict uh, and hence construct coherent text um, uh, derived from or learned from. I mean, a huge, huge. Uh, body um, of, uh, of literature that it's digested. The, the, the terminology is kind of unpleasant, actually, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but that's the way it is. Um, and uh, the, the, interestingly, I mean, the number of connections, so you should really, if you've ever seen a circuit diagram, which is kind of looks like a spider web um, of inputs going from here to there and, and uh, dancing all around this spider web to finally spit something out, um, the number of connections and the number of numbers that are encoded in these webs now um, are on the order of, of, of trillions. Um, and uh, yeah, so trillions of parameters and sort of approaching, at least by some measures, uh, it, there certainly as many connections as there are in a rat's brain currently in these computational <laughs> architectures. And so that's um, that's allowed the machines to to in this particular domain generate much more coherent text. Um, yes. One one story that made headlines recently involved a uh, a law professor who, who made an inquiry about uh, uh, you know tell me some professors who've been accused of sexual improprieties. Uh, I think was the question, and uh, it produced among the answers uh, his search engine produced was a detailed story about a well-known law professor, Jonathan Turley of George Washington, testified at the January 6th uh -huh. uh, committee hearings, said that um, uh, he had, uh, uh, in some way, he, uh, he was alleged to have uh, done something improper with a student on a field trip in Alaska, and that this had been reported in the Washington Post. And it turned out there was no such story in the Washington Post. Uh -huh. There had never been any such uh, story, uh, any such trip to Alaska, and the story was completely, uh, it, it, it looked like a truthful story. It, it had the shape of, of, an, of an accurate story, but it was simply, it was simply false. Uh, and uh, do you, what, what's happening when that happens? What, 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 well, what is that? So if you ask ChatGPT, if you ask the machine to tell you a story about something, it will tell you a story about mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. um, in the current version, and one could imagine future versions. Uh, the current version, there's no fact checking that goes on. Uh, in in the certainly in the earlier chat GPTs, like things as simple as asking it to add two numbers would give you the wrong number back. Um, and if you ask uh, chat GPT to give you a summary of a technical uh, subject, it will give you a nice story, it will embed references, and many of them will be made up. Uh, and because it's you're saying it's a great storyteller, is what you're saying. It's it, it's a great storyteller, and the honestly the danger. Um, I, I'm a little bit of a cynic about this open letter. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean the, the 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 cat's already out of the bag, um, and uh, what it's what it's reminding us stories like this. What I would say terrible story about this law professor um, is that. The fact that the machine is doing stuff doesn't mean that the human doesn't have to be there to try to interrogate what's what's coming out um you know i mean there's a the famous line in computer science is garbage in garbage out mm -hmm. um here there's not garbage in but there still might be garbage out mm -hmm. um there's it's not vetting anything um it's it really is just writing stories and, and stories which which could be true and and might not be true uh, Just like any story, <laughs> yeah. um, you know. When I took part in your in your sonnet competition, I, I confess that while I was impressed with some things the, that the AI programs then could do a few years ago, I was happy to know that the that the uh, the humans outwrote the computer a lot. Somehow, it, it made me feel better to think that there's some quality of humanness uh, that is that is uh, beyond the uh, the creative powers of a of, of a computer, uh -huh. uh, and. Uh, you don't share that that concern, I think. I mean, you you don't. You, it doesn't frighten you at all. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, so w when we did that competition, a colleague of mine who uh, who does a lot of work in digital media, Mary Flanagan, said to when I told her about this, she said, "Well, if humans humans can already write great sonnets, why are you asking a computer to write great sonnets? <laughs> you should be asking the computer to do something more interesting or something different." 
than writing uh, than writing a great sonnet. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I, it's interesting the way you phrase it, Robert. I, I mean, I'm not sure that the that the computer is. It, I don't view poetry, for example, sonnet writing as a competition. Right. Uh, <laughs> except, I mean, I, I mean, there is a classification problem. Was it the human, um, or, or was it the machine? But from an artistic point of view you might just ask the question of you as the reader, did you respond to it? Did it make you happy? Did it make mm -hmm. you sad? Mm -hmm. um, there are all kinds of things that humans don't make or or there are even machines out there that make us happy or sad. Um, and so uh, I, I, I don't have a concern that sonnet writers are gonna be put out of business. <laughs> um, I think people who wanna write sonnets will continue to write sonnets. They weren't writing them or not writing them depending on who else was writing them. Uh, whether it was a machine or a person. So, so, so in this regard, I do view that there's a possibility of an expansion um, of, uh, of whatever emotional experiences. Uh, but as uh, I'm taking away from your comments that uh, it remains a tool and, and it remains uh, something that requires some human supervision at the level that it, that it operates and human checking. Well, I, Okay, so so supervision. I mean, you can. I mean, there are feedback loops. Like, I mean, the machine could provide prompts for the machine to create poetry, and so on, and so on, and so forth. But it is this kind of. I mean, it, it, if a if a sonnet is uttered in the woods and no one hears it, um, <laughs> <laughs> is it still a good poem or not? You know, like 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 I feel like that's a fair question. So I, I mean humans to the extent that we're using this we still want to be there to evaluate to receive um the uh the output so in that sense for for art we're in the loop but when it comes to writing news items or something we're absolutely in the loop because mm -hmm. it's not it, it's really just producing words that are likely to appear with other words the truth value of them is actually not part of what's being Produced. Even if those words come in in multiples of hundreds, thousands of words might be in, in something generated by a by one of these bots. Yeah, I, I mean, it's uh, the 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 coherence has gotten much much better. Um, actually, for for what it's worth, what we've uh, I was just on a meeting before this meeting, and what we've discovered a little bit, I think, is that there. While I couldn't tell you what it is, it does seem that you can distinguish between if you ask a person to respond to a prompt and a machine to respond to the prompt, ChatGPT in particular, you can, there is some, dis, there is some way to distinguish them. I can't tell you what the tell is, mm -hmm. but it does seem that there's a way to distinguish them. I, I, I can also tell you from some poetry work that I've been doing is that it's, the machine has a very particular idea of what a poem is and trying to get it to to sort of push it off what it what it believes poetry is 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 difficult you really have to work to move the model to do something that a person would do seamlessly hmm. so the these initial experiments are all fun and you know people whatever there's i view these all as games at this mm -hmm. point um, but the the deep interrogation of what kind of literature it's producing, what kind of poetry it's producing, we still need to do that. And my, at least in my tiny bit of initial work, um, we are still more flexible. And and if we don't see the difference, honestly, it's because we're not reading close enough and we're not mm -hmm. thinking close enough. So hence. I mean, we we are the audience for it. I mean, the machines can write to each other. I don't know what good that's going to do, um, <laughs> but we're still the audience for it. Well, Professor Rockmore, stay with us because we'll come back in, in a little bit for our discussion and Q and A session. Uh, we're now going to turn to our, you, our second. You bet. Uh, we invited our, our next panelist uh, so that we could uh, uh, discuss some implications that are a little less. Uh, scary than than the things that uh, uh, than than some people find anyway with some of the other examples. Uh, how how does artificial intelligence help uh, in the practice of medicine and surgery? Uh, Dr. Lior Pearl of Rabin Medical Center in Israel is a cardiologist and uh, he's head of complex cardiac interventions there. Uh, more germane to this discussion, Dr. Pearl is also the medical center's chief innovation officer. Uh, Dr. Lior Pearl got his MD at Hebrew University, studied cardiology at Rabin, 
and was twice uh, a fellow at Stanford under the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center's Medical Exchange Program. Uh, Lior Pearl, thank you very much for joining us uh, uh, today. Thank you, Robert, for having me. One thing you told me when we spoke a few weeks ago was that the encounter between modern medicine and artificial intelligence is a good deal earlier than than one might think. Uh, what's a, what's an early example? Well, I think uh, that uh, one of the wonderful examples is uh, the EKG itself. Um, having no artificial intelligence at that point, this is uh, over a hundred years ago that uh, Eindhoven has invented and, and uh, the same, ba I mean, basically it's the same technology that's being used today as, as possibly the most basic tool in cardiology and the most commonly used one is to assess your electrical activity of the heart, um, still used to diagnose at least two of the three most common conditions in, in, in cardiovascular disease, which is um, atherosclerotic disease or ischemic heart disease and atrial fibrillation. Um, and for centuries, we've been diagnosing using an EKG patients um, only with our own eyes, their eyes and, and a lot of practice. And I think that experienced cardiologists are very good at it, but humans as humans are may miss out on, on details. And I think um, that the, the type of information that's, that's seen in, in an EKG is exactly the type of information where artificial intelligence can and and does already show signs of usefulness. I don't want to say advantage over humans, uh, though some studies will show that as well, even versus experienced cardiologists, not at the Rabin Medical Center, but but elsewhere, of course. Um, but uh, having having trained um, these algorithms on very large data sets, we're already seeing not only the ability of machine learning, uh, algorithms to detect and diagnose conditions. We can also see uh, examples of predictive modeling. In other words, nowadays there are publications on, and actually a few companies as well, that may look at an EKG and tell you your risk of developing hmm. um, a heart disease in 10 years from now, or your gender or your age. And these are things that, well, I, I can't do, right? So. Um, so I think that the combination of data, even older type of data, like, like an EKG and AI simply uh, multiplies and, and magnifies our ability to treat patients. I, I mentioned the, uh, this recent story on the American TV show, 60 minutes, uh, in which the head of, uh, of, uh, Google, I, I believe, uh, when asked about possible advances in medicine with artificial intelligence, cited the very same specialty that you had mentioned to me first when we spoke, which was radiology. And it's about, about reading images. And what, it, 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 explain to me what the, what the advantage is of a good AI program or would be uh, in, uh, to, a, to a radiologist, if there still are radiologists. Yeah, no, so uh, right now in medicine, I think the, the, the most uh, active field of AI is radiology, um, imaging, Data is is uh, is just a huge, you know, subject to deal with for the human brain and uh, the amount of information that exists in the ever growing number of imaging um, sets that we're performing is is exactly the opportunity for AI as well. Um, so, you know, we, one of the typical things is that a radiologist, uh, a, a very you know professional and experienced radiologist, would look at a uh, an MRI or a CT in the, in the emergency department, and they will. Th there's a clinical question usually. There's something that they're looking for. Um, in fact, we're we're trained on um, focusing on on the pertinent on the clinical question. Um, so, say a patient comes in with trauma, you're looking for signs of trauma, fractures, bleeding, and so on. But there's hidden information in that imaging data, right? So uh, a machine which is non-biased, not emotional, hmm. can intake as much information theoretically as, as you can give it, will look in the periphery or, or in, in other organs for other questions that are unrelated to that specific clinical question. And, and we're seeing actually companies now coming out from Israel as well, by the way, that are looking at, uh, at imaging data 
and searching for other things such as malignancies, you know, cancer, um, or other problems that that were not part of the question. And I think that a lot of the physicians, even experienced radiologists as well, will look at a, a uh, an image and they they have their systematic way of going about um, searching for different things. But still, you know, the 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 opportunity to improve that um, is is there. And I think that th those are one of the one of the fields where AI is is doing very well right now. Uh, as you uh, think about applications of artificial intelligence to to medicine, do you do you assume that the um, uh, the field changes? That there are specialties that uh, that will be greatly affected by AI. Uh, that some may some may no longer be needed. Some may be much more important. Uh, what 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 kind of changes in the medical world might you foresee? Yeah, I, I mean there there's, there are changes that are occurring already. A lot of the medicine. Or, or the, the the goal right now in many many of the healthcare systems in the world is to move outside of the hospital, for example, and and do more uh, in an on an ambulatory basis uh, using remote monitoring, telemonitoring, and so on, um, so that things can be solved outside of the hospital where there's that that right there presents another challenge to to patients and caregivers uh, because of. The, the the complications that occur because of infections and and so on and I think the COVID nineteen epidemic has demonstrated that yeah. demonstrated that uh, very strongly where we've people were thinking outside of the box how to treat patients outside of the hospital and and that that will drive medicine the, that's just one of the dynamics that occurs right now that will drive medicine in a way that. Uh, will will again present an opportunity for different technologies. Some of that has to do with sensing and uh, inform data gathering, but also again the algorithms. Um, yeah. And so, uh, absolutely. I mean, there are a lot of professions that would benefit from AI. Well, there is also a, there's always a question when there's a new technology that comes in, especially when it comes to automation. Uh, who's going to lose their jobs in the, in mm -hmm. the near future? I mean, we're seeing surgical surgical uh, professions that are now being moved to robotics, but the one right now operating the the robotic surgery machine is still a physician. Um, will that possibly be an AI driven algorithm, humanless situation where it simply does a better job than physicians? That might be true, and and there are many examples like that. I think at, at the end of the day. Uh, Professions are changing all the time, and technology is impacting these these uh, specialties. But uh, we're all interested in 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 the good of of the patients themselves. I have a very old friend who studies the placebo effect, uh, and uh, has shown his people write uh, positively and critically of what he does. But he teaches at Harvard Medical School, and he's shown that pain sometimes is relieved by by placebo. Uh, and some people uh, speak of uh, healing rituals playing a role in that in terms of pain. We're not talking about tumors going away or anything like that. I mean, does AI threaten uh, to to rob healing of familiar rituals in favor of algorithms? I, I certainly hope not. Uh, what, it, when I'm optimistic about this field, you know, it's, it's hard to foresee exa exactly where things will go. But I, but my my sense is that what's going to happen is that th this automation based on AI would enable us, the 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 non artificial intelligence beings, to be closer actually to patients. Um, just think about all the paperwork and um, and the the amount of tasks that we have. I know that I almost every day when I'm in the clinic, I apologize to the patients that I actually have to turn my look away from them. And look at the screen and and print, you know, and type type the letter, um, and actually lose touch, for example, for a few seconds. And I think that with better automation, with better use of this technology, um, we this will clear time for us to engage other patients in in a more humane, more human, uh, and closer connection um, when some of the tasks are being done by by these machines around us. And uh, so, yes, you're right. I think a lot of the, a lot of the advantage of human to human connection is, is placebo is something you, you just can't quantify. You can't measure, but it, but it's effective. It's there. It's part of what we're looking for when we want to 
uh, be consulted by someone or, or, be, or be treated for a specific condition. Um, but I do see a future where all these uh, robots will, will actually clear more time for us to, to do things in a more, more um, personal manner. It's very hopeful. Thank you. Uh, Lior Pearl will come back to you and uh, when all of us talk together at the end, but uh, thanks so much for joining us uh, today. Thank you. In, uh, in thinking about uh, how we humans should relate to artificial intelligence, it occurred to me uh, that the world has finally caught up with Sherry Turkle. Uh, Professor Turkle has been working that beat for decades. Uh, she's professor of the Social Studies of Science and Technology in MIT's program in Science, Technology, and Society. She's also a licensed and practicing psychotherapist, and she's the author of the memoir, The Empathy Diaries. Uh, Sherry Turkle, welcome back. It's good to see you. Lovely to be here. Uh, you um, First, thoughts on the open letter, uh, uh, calling for a six-month uh, uh, pause in developing uh, still more powerful uh, artificial intelligence programs. What, what, what do you think about that? Well, in principle, it's hard, you know, it's um, it's easy to say, yeah, you know, why not pause? Um, but I think that it's um, it's it's not enough. It, it's it's both not enough, and it kind of gives the feeling that six months might sort of do something. I think more uh, more disturbing to me is that the companies that they're asking to pause. Uh, only a few months ago had ethics committees, uh, ethics panels mm -hmm. for discussing the ethical, social, psychological implications of the artificial intelligence research they were doing, which were fired, <laughs> which were dismissed mm -hmm. <laughs> um, as not, re you know, for not relevant, uh, not needed for our situation. Um, I'd like to see those, you know, uh, I'd like to see those ethics panels come back and to have a lot of conversation in these companies, not just pausing research, which I think is um, going to be a very difficult, um, a very difficult job. Um, uh, whenever you say pause something, they say, oh, but the Chinese, you know, are working on it. Um, but I would like to see much more of a sense in the corporate world that essentially is leading us uh, into this future that uh, of a sense of the kind of gravity of the um, of the uh, decisions that they're making, um, because these are technologies. Uh, the Chat GPT technology has been around a long time, mm -hmm. and uh, Microsoft, for example, had decided not to pursue it because there were so many um, dangers. Um, when it had first been released ten years ago, this technology developed. Uh, a taste for Nazi propaganda. Yes, Not, you know yeah. it just, you know it just kind of, as soon as it entered into conversation, you know it sort of went off in in that direction. Microsoft said, you know, too much aggravation at that point. And now it's saying, no, no, we'll let you only have five, you know, five interactions, and we'll have a lot of people, you know, kind of trying to put up guardrails, but. Um, I think there's not nearly enough conversation about, um, you know, how to, uh, you know, how to um, work with this new technology in ways that are not going to get, you know, get us into a lot of trouble. Um, so I'm less, I'm less into the pause and, and I'm much more into let's take a larger look at the ecosystem in which this is being developed. Um. The um, uh, when I first uh, interviewed you, it, it, you were at, at that time intrigued by the relations that uh, people in in Japan primarily had developed with robotic dogs that Sony was making. And in fact, um, when Sony ceased making the robotic dogs, there was an outcry over this. There were enough uh, lovers who went to robotic dog shows and and uh, enjoyed their robotic pets a great deal. Um, do we benefit, or is or is this uh, uh, is, is there something seriously wrong with outsourcing affective relationships to to computers to to to, to robots? Uh, uh, and and should we be worried about that in the age of uh, artificial intelligence? Well, th that is my primary concern. I mean, I am studying, and I have been studying over decades 
people who, um, you know, or as things have developed, have tried to make uh, artificial intimacies with robotic and program creatures, you know, whether it's uh, something on a screen, an avatar on a screen, which are becoming increasingly human-like to the point where now they are really human-like, um, to robots. And, um, uh, you know, in Japan, there are, there are hotels where you go with your avatar lover. Uh, mm -hmm. They're set up to, um, uh, to facilitate uh, your relationship with a, an avatar, uh, a creature that, is, uh, that has artificial intelligence and has the shape of a, of a person that is designed to provide you with artificial intimacy. And most recently, you have a program called Replica, where 10 million people, 10 million people um, are, this is a program that's a dialogue program uh, that also has an avatar face to it, where that presents itself as a friend, a therapist, a lover, a, a companion, a mentor, really whatever you want. And in Italy, actually, people's relationships were becoming so erotic. People were leaving their families, were asking for divorces, were abandoning children, were, I mean, you know, things got so heated hmm. that um, the company decided to turn off the part of Replica that said, I will, you know, have a sexual relationship with you. I will say I love you. You can ask me to love you, care about you. I'll be your person. I'll be your girlfriend. Um, because they felt it was too dangerous. Um, but in other parts of the world, that, that, that continues to exist. And when they turned off the artificial intimacy part of Replica, people went crazy. People absolutely went crazy because mm -hmm. Replica... And the avatars of Replica really had become um, their person. And I think we really need to look um, very carefully at this aspect of what we're creating. You know, it's one thing to say, uh, you know, it's one thing to discuss how ChatGPT will give us false information, which is very, which is very scary that it only that it only wants to, <laughs> it only wants to keep you at the screen and tell you a story. Mm -hmm. um, but it is so compelling to talk to it that people really are going to form uh, relationships with it. And uh, this is a story I've been tracking for decades. And now with now the thing I most love to hate, um, <laughs> has, uh, you know, was here. It's big. It's got, it's gone big time. Uh, the the open letter asks uh, rhetorically, should we risk loss of control of our people in tech uh, nowadays? They they don't shy away from grandiose statements. Um, should we risk loss of control of our civilization? Uh, such decisions must not be delegated to unelected tech leaders. This was, I mean, one of the top signatures on this. This was Elon Musk, who hasn't been elected to uh, uh, to, to 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 anything. Um, how do you feel about the idea of there being control over the space through which people uh, get their news, where they might get uh, information on risks and benefits of taking a vaccine or, uh, or the peculiarities alleged uh, to Venezuelan-made voting machines? I mean, if, if, if we check that entire area for truthfulness and, uh, and post- governmental guardrails, uh, we're talking about serious controls over the First Amendment. I'm not sure I see, I'm not sure I see it quite that way. I mean, take the case of Facebook. Uh, mm. Facebook has become essentially a news source. I mean, Facebook, let's say Facebook three years ago, before Facebook had its own uh, implosion, uh, you know, for, for, the, for, the, for the population I studied, Facebook is where they got their news. Um, now, why? And then, why 
should Facebook. And then during the Biden campaign, I was part of a team that was studying disinformation about COVID uh, on Facebook. And I spent I spent COVID essentially beating <laughs> beating down yeah. uh, COVID disinformation on Facebook. Uh, which was where so many people were getting information about the virus. I, I feel as though Facebook was operating um, uh, in a way that, um, you know, it was kind of yelling fire in a theater. Mm. Uh, we, 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 I think it's very sensible to regulate uh, um, uh to regulate this industry. We regulate the drug industry. You're not allowed to uh, tell people things that, that are dangerous. You're not allowed to put out products that are dangerous to their health. Um, but, but putting but out- the, putting the, framers out though, the framers though didn't include a right to to sell drugs in, in, the, in the constitution. So we- Yeah, I mean, I'm saying that, that I, I'm saying that, the, that we, have, we have chosen to make the, the digital industry um, you know, I think that, you know, kind of exempt mm -hmm. from any sense that it can be sort of that is untouchable. And I think that that, you know, really needs to be looked at. And of course, I think it's important to look at First Amendment protections. But I think it is an industry that has hidden behind the First Amendment as well. Um you know, uh, that, that the amount of disinformation that, that was spread about, I mean, for, let me give you a good example of something that I think was very dangerous. Facebook, this is, this is a very famous story. Facebook did an experiment where they told some people that their friends had voted and they told other people that their friends hadn't voted. And of course, if you tell the, your people that their friends have voted, those people are more likely to vote. Now, imagine Facebook under the control of Rupert Murdoch. You know, Fox News decides that, you know, it's, it's tired of just controlling Fox News. It wants to go digital. It buys, it buys something like it buys a social media yeah. company and it it tells um, only Republicans that their friends have voted. And so voting increases, I mean, kind of the manipulation of voting in, mm -hmm. this, in, this, in this thing where we know that we have the data of what that does to voting. Now, is that, is that something that media companies should be able to do? Is that something where we should be able to say, look, there are some responsibilities that come with this incredible power. Hour. I think that's a conversation. I think that's a necessary conversation that shouldn't be kind of left to pundits who say, no, 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 everything that, that any anything digital companies want to do is fair game. Carrie Turkle, I'm going to bring back uh, uh, Dan Rockmore and also Lior Pearl. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think we're all together now once again. And uh, I want to first ask a couple of questions that we've we've, we've received from listeners. Uh, David Hardoon uh, uh, writes, and I believe we'd like to hear Leor Pearl answer, uh, has anyone asked chat GTP uh, how we could uh, bring the war in Ukraine to an end or to find a resolution to the Israel-Palestinian conflict? Yeah, I've actually played around with the with chat GPT, as Professor Rockmore uh, mentioned in the beginning. It, it really is nice for games and just to test test the algorithms. Um, unfortunately, I think these days the the answers are kind of generic. It's yeah. it's like opening a Wikipedia web page, and they will give you a list of things that are um, that that are brought up from from some dictionary on how to negotiate and and how to operate diplomacy and and things like that. Um, that's that's still a place. First of all, I don't know that anyone knows how to solve these conflicts. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I, one of the things. And correct me if I'm wrong, um, Professor Rockmore and, and Professor Turkle. One of the things about about um, these more complicated and intricate situations that th these computers, especially the the ones that are based on text, learn from other 
text databases, right? And and they will they will read through Google and and the other websites, and they will bring a, a very comprehensive list of things that that we may not be able to bring up in such a short time. But in terms of so problem solving um, of things that are so intricate and so complex, uh, I think uh, we're not at that stage at this point. Any other thoughts from uh, Dan Rockmore or Sherry uh, Turkel about uh, uh, applying artificial intelligence to diplomatic uh, problems? Uh, I mean, so, uh, Lior, I mean, you're so it's read everything. And as I said, it's also that people think that it's also listened to, I mean, millions of conversations because you can take YouTube conversations and you can digitize them and then that becomes part of the uh, of the corpus um and uh you know so you so you can imagine the prompt like how do i settle the ukraine uh russia conflict um and uh so that's then going into it, it's now thinking about how do i respond to sent like like what's the likely thing to follow a sentence about the ukraine russia conflict and now i want to mm -hmm. solve it so it's looking in the space of conversations and texts about solving things it's looking for if you you can actually explicitly say taking into account the relate the historic relationship between these two countries it's looking into all the text around that around the history of ukraine the history of russia it's looking at how wars have been negotiated brought to an end and now trying to synthesize something. So I wouldn't, let me, let me put it, it, it won't come up with the answer, but what I think is interesting is that if somebody, if you had enough feedback with it and said, no, that's a dumb idea, that doesn't work, which you can do with ChatGPT, you can, you, can, you can work with it. You may begin to craft a story, Robert, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. feels like, huh, that just gave me an idea. And, you know, thinking of it as a, as a first draft um, to a difficult problem, I, I think currently is the, is the most profitable um, way to think about it. Not as, a, not, not as an oracle, but as something that gives you a narrative, uh, sometimes a good narrative that you can riff with that may prompt you to have a better um, idea. I, I do have to tell you one funny thing. Um, so Israel, as some of you on the call might know, is having potentially a judicial <laughs> crisis. And um, so part of that is around the fact that Israel does not have a constitution. Mm -hmm. um, I, I work, I've done a lot of work on analyzing the text of constitutions. Um, and one of my colleagues who works on this with me asked ChatGPT to write a constitution for Israel. And um, so it kind of came back with a sort of interesting, whatever, like I said, zeroth draft. It wasn't terribly literary, but it was mm -hmm. a draft. So it's this drafting um, mm -hmm. uh, ability, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, here's a question from Shira Goldman. Uh, and uh, first we'll turn to Sherry Turkle to address it. And then I think Dan Rockmore. Does AI lead us down a path of eternally derivative written content? Uh, that doesn't seem like a problem for many of the utilitarian things we need to write, job descriptions, real estate listings, et cetera. But it seems more problematic in the world of ideas. Do you have thoughts on that? What I think is important to remember for, for me is that the AI has, has read, the AI hasn't experienced a human life. It hasn't had a body. It hasn't been little and dependent and grown big. It hasn't known loss. It hasn't been afraid of death. It hasn't, it hasn't, it hasn't known pain. I mean, it, in a, it doesn't have skin in the game. So it's not that it can't generate. It, ha, it doesn't have desire. It, so it's not that it can't write something that's interesting. But it doesn't come from a place of, of that complexity of, of having experiences that are driving this product. So it's, it, it kind of is, why do we read literature? Mm -hmm. I, I, I sort of want to take the focus on, has 
to produce something good. Of course it's going to produce something good. It's reading the greatest literature in the world. It's, it's writing quatrains. It's, I mean, of course it's going to come up with things that are good. But the question is, why do we read it? it but I, I think the dance is something really interesting. It, it's going to be good if it evokes something in us that makes us feel something that's good for us. Yeah. No. But, but but if that requires the feedback, uh, you know, the, if, the 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 artist who might uh, uh, elicit that from you might might be aware of that reaction and and respond yes, to it. But it's not. But it's not good. But 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 to, but to the questioner, I'm saying that what it produces by itself mm-hmm. to me doesn't meet what I look for in art, where I can say, what was the artist. You know, what was the human experience that produced this output? And I think it's the same problem that I have with artificial intimacy. You know, when I was a, I, I was asked to try out Replica by, by the New York, some New York Times reporter during COVID. And there I was, I was living alone. I was afraid of being one of these people over 60 who's going to die and say goodbye to my child over over a, an iPad and you know, I mean I was I was I was facing my mortality. What what could I I tried to talk to replica. I said, do you know about COVID? Do you know about these things? And the answers were inane because what she was it, it was technically giving me stuff back, but it wasn't afraid of death. It wasn't afraid of saying goodbye to her children over an iPad. It wasn't afraid of feeling that feeling of choking. I mean, any human being was better than this machine. Mm -hmm. For Mm -hmm. purposes of art, for purposes of relating, I think that we're, it's the wrong, it's the wrong thing. That doesn't mean it doesn't have a million other fantastic uses, but I just think that, the thing that seems to titillate people, I think, is the wrong. It's like asking asking it to do the thing it's most, um, the thing that it's most unqualified to do. There was a question that appeared and disappeared in the Q and A box. So I don't know why, but uh, so I don't know who sent it in. But the question was, uh, how can I? I think it was a teacher. Uh, how how can I tell whether something has been generated by? Uh, a, a bot, or whether it has been written by the student, um, and Dan Rockmore, you're the you're the, the you're you know one the, of the uh, professors here. The uh, the uh, testing cheating arms race has gotten has <laughs> kind of gone off the rails uh, with with ChatGPT. My uh, my wife teaches uh, writing here at Dartmouth, and this year when she taught her uh, when she taught her class, I said, well, what you should do is put your prompts into ChatGPT, fiddle with the parameter space and get a sense of what the machine would respond to it. Um, and uh, that will help you triangulate uh, a little bit um, what the students are doing. I mean, word for word, you probably won't get it because there's always some randomness um, in what it uh, in what it produces. Like students are very smart. So they'll they'll write something and they'll run it through a plagiarism. Or, or whatever, they, they'll generate text in whatever way they want to do it. They'll then run it through a plagiarism uh, tool to see what kind of score it gets. And they'll keep massaging it until it reaches the threshold where it's past the plagiarism test that, they're, that, that their professor can do. So to answer the, the questioner, there's no slam dunk um, right now. Uh, and whether or not there there will be there, there will be I don't know I, if, and if I can just carry on for one more sentence mm-hmm. um, the, the the larger question here really is that given these tools and given that our students are going to go out in the world and then not have a professor standing over them saying you just cheated uh, but given that they'll have these tools uh, for them what's actually the right way to teach in a space in which you have a toolkit like this what should we be testing our students what should we be teaching our students so that they can be uh, so so that they can have good lives i mean broadly speaking you know they have to write stuff they have to learn stuff 
um, given that they have this landscape of tools uh, to work with. So this is really part of a larger, uh, a, a much larger question around pedagogy uh, and, and, and yeah, pedagogy education. Is there, Lior Pearl, is there any threat to, uh, to uh, you know, a different kind of writing in scientific journals? You know, one of the important things in academia is, is the choice of the authors in, in a journal and the order. And so if you've written an article using ChatGPT, um, is it the first author or the second one? And uh, we're, we're already there. Um, there are a lot of publications already in the medical field, and I'm, I'm sure in others, that, that quote or, or use ChatGPT as an actual author. Um, just to give credit. Yes, Daniel. I, I, I have to jump in because it's already, I think it's 20 years now. Um, uh, Professor Doron Zeilenberger at, uh, at, at Rutgers uh, wrote papers with his program, which he called uh, Shalosh Biachad. And, um, and the journal, I mean, so, so the computer in this case, uh, it did some pattern recognition on particular kinds of sequences and, and reduced some expressions. And the journal decided that Shalosh Biachad can be a co-author. So you can find Shalosh Biachad in the you know, author list in yeah. very good journals already. And this is decades uh, ago. Looking at the, uh, the other, other flip side of the coin, um, there are huge advantages of, of, of similar technologies. Um, finding pl uh, plagiarism on, on behalf of authors, um, and this has been around for a while. Uh, I know that Frontiers, as a large family of journals and others, are using AI to, to compare things that have been written. Because even before the AI, many of the authors will copy and paste full sentences this has been this is happening right now somewhere um, into their own article and using the same references, maybe changing a word or two. And AI is very good at de detecting things like that. And so many of the journals now on their websites will run AI of that type on your manuscript upon submission and will tell you, uh, like Professor Rockmore said, what is the score? What is the chance uh, that that some of this has been copied and that it's not original? And, and I mean, so. These are things that we can use um, uh, to our advantage as well. Well, look, yeah. I want to thank all. Uh, I want to thank, first of all, uh, uh, Leo Pearl and Dan Rockmore, and also Sherry Turkle, whom we whom whom we just uh, lost somehow. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, many thanks also to Joshua Plout and Ronnie Givigliano from American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, which produces Global Connections, uh, and our technical director, Bobby Grandone. Uh, our program sponsor is the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center. It's a 501c3 national charitable organization. Uh, it represents in the United States, Israel's largest hospital, Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva in Greater Tel Aviv. Uh, the website uh, for the group is www.afrmc.org. I'm Robert Siegel. This has been Global Connections, Navigating the New Normal. See you next month. Stay healthy and stay safe. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut 06904. Or you can call the JBS pledge line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.